On this edition of Independent Sources, United by Flavors, mapping America's ethnically diverse history to its food, and Moonshine Education, a Puerto Rican favorite makes its way to the U.S. via the South Bronx. Independent Sources, your window to the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Here's your host, Gary Pierre-Pierre. When you think of the classic American meal, hamburgers, fries, and apple pie may come to mind. But you might be surprised to know that some of the most common flavors in American cuisine include curry powder and soy sauce. The new release, Eight Flavors, The Untold Story of American Cuisine, explores how eight influential ingredients have shaped the way Americans eat. Joining me in studio to talk about the book is its author, Sarah Lohman. Welcome. Well, <laughs> Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So how did you come that, now we're down to eight flavors? Really, these flavors just sort of fell into place. Um, I was spending a lot of time looking at cookbooks from different historic time periods in America. Um, I have a pretty big collection of originals and reproductions. So I was looking from 1800 to the contemporary to 2000 and after. And I just started by writing down the ingredients that were highly flavorful, that were used multiple times. I came up with a list of maybe about 40 ingredients, mm -hmm. but there were ones that stuck out that were used more than all the others, things like black pepper and vanilla. Mm -hmm. And then when I also re-examined this, this list, I saw that it was very easy to pick out not only the major flavors of a time, but also flavors that represented big shifts in American culture and could be really easily laid out on a timeline of the past 200 years. So in a way, I, in the book I say, I didn't so much pick them as discover them. Mm -hmm. They just fell into place to tell this story. Give us the list. Uh, mm -hmm. You mentioned black pepper. Yep, that's uh, the earliest uh, one. Okay. And then uh, vanilla. Uh -huh. uh, then chili powder. Curry. Uh, chili powder. Chili powder. Yep. Okay. Um, comes from the American Southwest, but it was it is mentioned there before Texas becomes part of America when mm -hmm. it's still part of Mexico. Okay. So it really lets me focus on this part of the country that is both. American and Mexican at the same time. Um, so black pepper, vanilla, um, curry, uh, chili powder, curry powder, um, soy sauce, garlic, mild sodium glutamate, and sriracha. Yeah. So this book in many ways is as much of a historical book as it is a culinary book. Yes. So why do you think it took so long for somebody to have written a book like that? <laughs> well, I wouldn't say that I'm the first, um, but I think that their food is a very powerful way to tell stories about culture. Um, the field of culinary history is relatively new, at least as an accepted field. And um, the feeling about that really is that it is a history that often deals with women. Um, and as I talk a lot about my book, it deals with the disenfranchised in America too. We're talking about um, the vanilla chapter is actually all about um, brilliant men, but brilliant men who are also enslaved too. Um, I talk a lot about immigration and how uh, Chinese immigrants and Italian immigrants were not only hated, but then banned in very xenophobic legislation. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, this is a story Culinary history is a powerful way to talk about our history as human beings, mm -hmm. to make connections through something we all do, which is eat. But it's also a history that in some ways maybe hasn't gotten a lot of airtime until recently because it is about people that the history books don't normally write about. Mm -hmm. Well, I'd like to continue on that, on, yeah. that, on that theme because, you know, as you mentioned, all the flavors re represent, you know, one country or another. Right. And immigrant, immigration is at the base of it. So what does this say about uh, America's culture and its history uh, as a country? America is an immigrant nation. Uh, even in this book, I refer to the, the earliest people who came here as English immigrants, because that's exactly what they were. Um, and I think that the book also makes an argument against the fact that um, Anglo culture is the dominant culture. Even when you begin looking at white culture, you have these ideas of the Germans. You mentioned the hamburger, which 150 years ago was considered ethnic, ethnic cuisine. Food, yes. Yeah, <laughs> and now we use that to define American, American food. Yes. So even taking that idea and looking at something like, okay, well, what will be next? In another 150 years, will we see American cuisine as all Beijing-style dumplings, or you know, what what comes in? 
So I um, use this book to talk about how America is not one culture. It's not one white English speaking culture. It is all of these different people of different colors, different backgrounds, different languages, and different food ways coming together and sharing uh, ideas in a way that you really don't see in other parts of the world. Do you think this book is more needed now given the current political climate <laughs> yes we're, yeah we're living yeah I you know what I of course I've been writing this book a long time I'm writing it for five years and I did not expect this book to come out post a, a Trump election oh. um, even with the Clinton election I thought that it would be a book that would continue to push ideas towards immigration in a positive direction I did not know that releasing this book now was all-out war against the ideas that have been elected into our government. Um, and so for me, I think like many people, it's been a wake-up call that I was too complacent. And even though I was telling these stories that it's important to speak out and speak louder and to act on those words too. So I hope that this book makes some people feel more at home here. I hope for others it makes them more welcoming, and I hope for still others it educates them to think about American culture in a way that they haven't thought about before, as one of diversity, not sure. homogeny. And so let's go back to Sriracha, because uh, it has become basically a, a cult yeah, <laughs> success. Yeah. And, and, and so what kind of effect you think Sriracha will have in, in, in cooking? Well, to me, when I think of Sriracha, I think of the story behind it and what I've learned about the family who created it. Tell us about that story. It was created by a man named David Tran. and was a Vietnamese? A re Vietnamese refugee. And I think that that's really important to say. His, his family is ethnically Chinese, and they were a population targeted in Vietnam after the fall of Saigon. So his family came through Hong Kong, through the UN's International Port of Refuge, and then were placed here in America as refugees. He arrived in January of 1980, which, think about that, coming from Vietnam uh, to Boston is where they landed in January. Um, and he said he just thought, I need to do something to support my family. He called up his brother, who had been placed outside of L.A., and said, do they have hot peppers there? And his brother said, yes. David had been a hot sauce maker in Vietnam, and so he picked up his family, traveled from Boston to California, and within a month, by February of 1980, he was making sriracha. So it's only been around uh, 30 years, okay. and it's really fascinating to watch how this ingredient went from an ingredient intended for this new Vietnamese population to something that, yeah, if you open up the refrigerator of anyone, yes, yes, you too, <laughs> um, it's there. So to me, his story is quintessentially American. It's this whole idea of pull yourself by your bootstraps and uh, giving people who work hard a chance. But at the same time, one of the big discussions we're having right now is targeting refugees and preventing them from coming to this country. So we're not even giving people the chance to become Americans like David Tran did and contribute to our society. You know, for some people, they might just think of it as a bottle of hot sauce. For me, it represents so much, much more. more. Yeah, certainly. So now you chose MSG as one of your yeah, favorites. And I as did. you know, that's very controversial. Yes, so yes. Why did you pick that? Well, like any of the other chapters, I lay out my argument very, very carefully. And I actually picked um, monosodium glutamate or MSG because most people associate MSG with one type of food. Chinese food. Chinese food, exactly. And a lot more chefs have been speaking out about that and saying that that belief is xenophobic. It's based out of fear and our idea of what Chinese takeout and Chinese people are um, and what they cook and what they put in their food. But the fact is that MSG is far more common in brands like uh, Kraft or Kentucky Fried Chicken than it is in Chinese cuisine. So in that book, I not only lay out that this is a cultural phenomenon not limited to Chinese food, that it is a part of American food, even if you don't realize it, but also there has been 30 years of science that have proved the model sodium glutamate is not harmful for you. I don't make an argument to eat it. It's, you know, it's not beneficial to your health either. If you eat it or not, it doesn't matter. But it's about correcting misinformation. You know, like, like, like most people, I don't use it because I read the same literature. So what does it add to a, to a dish? It adds a deep savoriness. And even if you're not shaking a white powder out of a bottle, um, you're still probably using it in your cooking. Every time you use tomatoes or Parmesan or if you're a fan of Japanese food, if you have any sort of seaweed-based 
based broth. These are all foods that are high in natu naturally occurring amounts of monosodium glutamate. MSG is not synthesized in a lab. It actually occurs naturally out in the world. And when it is sold as that white powder, it's harvested as a byproduct of a fermentation okay. process. Like, for example, I also uh, mentioned soy sauce in the book. Yes. Soy sauce is very high in naturally occurring monosodium glutamate. One last question. What's yeah. your favorite flavor from the book? Oh, how can I pick a favorite? Of course. That's too hard. <laughs> um, what is my favorite flavor? You know, I'll, I'll say one that at least we haven't mentioned so far. My favorite story that I explored was the story behind curry powder. That's the one that I got the most pushback on is that's not an American flavor. But curry powder has come to this country twice. It came with our Anglo immigrant roots. Um, but they got it from India. They got it from India, but the curries that are served in London aren't the curries served in India. And so it's those curries that came through British cookbooks okay. and were cooked in American culture long before Indian immigrants came here. And then it came here again. Um, starting at the turn of the 20th century, we see immigrants coming from Bangladesh, uh, from the north of India, the Punjab, and from modern day Pakistan. And then they bring their home cooking with them too. So it's this double wave of immigration. And now in 2016, we are seeing the children of the massive wave of immigration that's come from India starting in 1965. And it's really that generation, I think, that is going to, to make people realize that this food is American even though we've been cooking with curry powder for 200 years. Okay, unfortunately, we're out of time. It's a pleasure to talk to you. Sarah Lohman, thanks for joining us. Yes, thank you. When we come back, bringing African queens and kings to life for a new generation. Thanks for staying tuned. Many African-American children are more familiar with Cinderella than they are Cleopatra. Your Queens is a costume entertainment company that was created to change all that. The company hopes to educate audiences about the historical role of African kings and queens, as well as instill a greater sense of pride in African-American children. Abby Ishola learned more about Your Queens when she spoke to the company's creative director, Eki Asimota, and Jordan Gilles, the performer who portrays King Tut. Eki, I'll start with you. Um, why did you decide to start Your Queens? I started Year Queens because we are living at a time where you can feel a shift in the universe. There's so much going on. We can feel uh, pain, depression, uh, police corruption, police brutality. And it was a time where it was so important for our children and adults to really know who we are, that we didn't come from slavery. We came from kings and queens. So starting Year Queens, I always say there's nothing wrong with Disney, Disney princesses. Um, we grew up on Disney princess, and actually they started during the Great Depression. So starting something like Your Queens, where you can actually know that these men and women were royalty, like Queen Amina, uh, Makita, Queen of Sheba, and King Tut. So it's now for us to dress up like kings and queens and do different events so you can show, we can show your greatness and show that you came from kings and queens. Okay, and Jordan, you play King Tut. Yes. How, uh, did, how was it when you found out that Eki was doing this? How did you receive it? Well, I first found out <clears throat> from a friend who's one of the queens. Uh, she, she used to post on Instagram uh, what they were doing and I always thought it was a great idea and I used to commend her for doing it. And then uh, she contacted me saying, uh, we are looking for kings. So rightfully so, I was very excited to try to join the team. Wonderful. And we have a few images of the queens dressed yes. fully in garb. Yes, what are we, who yes, are we yes. seeing right now? You are seeing, um, that is Rashina, who plays Queen Amina. Mm -hmm. And Queen Amina, I love her because she was very determined, strong, she was a warrior queen from Nigeria, um, from the Hausa city. So she was known just to protect her land, building the earthen walls uh, surrounding Hausa city. And her story is so great because she knew, and something that we teach children, she knew at a very young age, her grandmother, and it's important to have, you know, inspirational woman around you. She knew at a young age that she was going to be someone great. Wow. Yeah. And um, then who's this? We're this is now. Goddess Isis. Gorgeous. Uh, played by Timmy Larode and Goddess Isis. Um, compared to like the, one of the first women in the world from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And she's known as the goddess of love, the goddess of peace, the goddess of light. And she was just 
an amazing woman who was all about motherly love and motherly and peace and unity and prosperity. Nice, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. I don't want to say costume, I would say garb. Garb, right? yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And who's this? This is Queen Nefertiti, also from Egypt. She was known as the beautiful one. Mm. Um, her head bust symbolized beauty and power. Mm. One thing we love about her story as well is her husband, King Akhenaten, uh, always portrayed her to be an equal counterpart. He believed in the unity of black love, of unity, of strong love, and they were very influential in um, religion. They believed in God, and that's what they portrayed. Wow, and who's this? This is Queen Nzinga, another fierce warrior queen from Angola, mm -hmm. the Congo. And she's also very well known for helping abolish slavery. Yeah, so her story is magnificent as well. And she was also about just her family and pushed her to be a warrior queen. Wow, this is amazing. Mm -hmm. Who's this? That's just another, it's a, you know, queens love to change their clothes. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> that is Goddess Isis, you can tell by her ah, wings. Yes. yes. With her white wings, absolutely. Beautiful, beautiful. So the garb, is it based on historical references? Did you do your research? And absolutely. Uh, your Queens was launched in January 2015. But the idea came late uh, 2014. We literally, I sat down for months to research these queens and meditate on it and really want to embody who they were before it was launched in January. And you could relate putting on the garb for King Tut. What is it like putting on what you're wearing and stepping into that? You know, it feels good, definitely. <laughs> uh, symbolizing royalty and also the, the perception and the... Um, just the response you get from the young boys, that, that's definitely one of the main things, you know, having them envision themselves as kings also. Wow. So what has the response been like? Well, uh, specifically for me, it's been great. Like, uh, like I said prior, the young boys, like, they come up to and hug me after, after the show. Wow. And they're just, like, so in awe. And then for the queens also. She could... Yeah, it's, it's very powerful. I would always say it's life-changing. Mm -hmm. And the plants where you have this dream, you have this goal, and instead of sitting on it, push it forward where a lot of people may text us, call us, or repost our photos, or book us for a daycare event, um, birthday parties, uh, college events, doing festivals, and people are literally in awe at time. And we want them to come and approach us and take a pictures with us and stand next to it and know that you are a king and queen as well. So the, sometimes it's we get teary-eyed, um, we're full of joy, and it's just every time we have an interview or do an event, we're just so thankful that we're able to do something like this that's been life-changing. Wow, so you're performing for people of all age groups. All age groups. What is the message like for different age groups? <laughs> uh, so I'll give you an example. So I p portray Makita, Queen of Sheba. If I am doing a presentation for uh, a daycare, I will say, my name is Makita, Queen of Sheba. I come from 950 BC. Do you know what BC is? Mm -hmm. They might respond, I was known for my faith, my wisdom, and my journey. Do you believe in yourself? Tell me, what do you like to do? Wow. So that'll be for the kids. Nice. Oh. <laughs> I, I almost want to answer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> for an adult, is, uh, if we did a 50-year-old birthday party, or even if it's for a teenager, we'll say, we were invited here by your school to tell you how wonderful and beautiful you are. My name is Makita, Queen of Sheba. I was known for my journey and my wisdom. We'll share our story, King Tut will share his story, and we have a Q&A portion where now that you have heard about all the kings and queens, we have some questions for you. So that's the educational compulsion where they're able to answer questions. So where's Makita from? So you know she's about, um, she's from Ethiopia. So if they answer the question, we actually give them a head wrap and tie their hair and introducing Queen Abby. And you know, <laughs> <laughs> round of applause. <laughs> then we do um, a dance. We have uh, different music and different uh, choreographies that we work on. So we'll do a dance just to dedicate it to them. After that, we'll mingle and take pictures. Uh, play some instruments and it's just our presentation can last from 30 minutes all the way up to two hours wow so it depends on who books us for what event sounds amazing mm -hmm. you're nigerian and dominican yes how much of your own heritage went into you wanting to do this <laughs> everything <laughs> you know i always say everything happens for a reason 
and I started out as um, always been creative since I was a little girl. I always knew I was going to dance. I always wanted to dance. So I teach dance now. But in my 20s and teens, I modeled, I designed jewelry, and very well known with uh, my jewelry line, Eki's Famous. And I think just with wanting to evolve and grow in life, that's where your queens came about, where I can kind of combine everything. Yeah. I didn't wake up saying, I'm ready to start a new company. It wasn't <laughs> that. It was just, I went to a birthday party one day. There were a lot of children. Um, you know, you go to birthday parties, you have a, there's a clown there, a Disney princess, it's nothing, no bulb went off. Mm -hmm. But this one day in 2014, I went to a birthday party and it was about 40, you know, beautiful African-American children mixed uh, all around and these two princesses came out, Caucasian princess, they were beautiful. But at that moment, I'm not sure why I was at that birthday party, a friend invited me and I was like, okay, I'm just gonna go. I don't, have, you know, I don't have any kids, but because I work with kids, they invited me. So when I was there, and that's when the idea kind of went off. It was like, so now I brought you here to start this company, and I didn't sit on it. Mm -hmm. It was just like, okay, this is what I'm Something supposed to do. to do. I had to do. Eki right. Asimota and Jordan Gill, thank you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Still to come on the show, a South Bronx distillery is expanding the borough's culinary credentials. Finally from us, a Bronx distillery is seeking to educate New Yorkers about one of Puerto Rico's favorite drinks, pitodo. The drink is a potent concoction made from sugar cane and seasonal fruit. Judith Escalona visited Port Moy's distillery, the first to produce pitodo legally in the U.S. Port Moy's distillery in the Bronx is bringing a new spirit to New York. It's called pitorro. Puerto Rican moonshine. Pitorro has been around many years, hundreds of years, and it's a Puerto Rican style moonshine. It's been done in the back um, of somebody's houses in the mountains, and um, every town has their own bootlegger. Pitorro shouldn't be confused with Puerto Rican rum or coquito, Puerto Rican eggnog. It's made through a different process. Pitorro is supposed to be made with any fruit that's in season. The people who are doing the really good pitorro is using fruits in their fermentation, their fermentation process. When you start doing rum, you're just doing 100% sugar. William Valentin, along with his childhood friend and business partner, Rafael Barbosa, were visiting family in Puerto Rico. While chatting over drinks, Barbosa had the idea of making pitorro in New York. I thought he was kind of, you know, off. You know, I thought it was, it was kind of impossible. Within five years, they were open for business and growing. They now make and distribute their own special blend of pitorro from the Port Morris section of the Bronx. He learned from his uncle when he was 17. It was a product mainly done from November to January through the holidays and as things progressed and years later, now people do it all year round. Valentin and Barbosa want their drink to be enjoyed year-round in the States as well. To that end, they've built an elaborate promotion for their product. Every time somebody comes through the door and doesn't know about us, we give them a tasting and a tour. So you have the pot still, you have these glasses that refine the, the spirits. With that tour, it includes how we make our brand, how we came to be, um, and then on the opposite side of our tasting room, we have a um, kind of a lounge type of area where we bring live music. That music is, of course, salsa and bomba y plena that can be enjoyed with an endless choice of cocktails Valentin and Barbosa have concocted. 16 at last count. We have flavors from habanero to coffee to ginger, to pineapple, to chocolate. 
Pitorro is so much a part of Puerto Rican culture that Valentin and Barbosa have made the Tasty Newman Bar look like a street in Old San Juan. They're still keeping up with the holiday tradition with their own special kind of coquito, made with that aged pitorro instead of rum. It's very delicious and it tastes identical to coquito, except it's non-dairy. Judith Escalona, Independent Sources. That's our show this week. Thanks for staying tuned. On behalf of the entire Independent Sources team, I'd like to wish you and your family happy holidays. Join us in the new year for more stories from the city's ethnic and immigrant communities. Till then, be independent-minded. <laughs>